to guard our, our lives and our country. We pray, Father, that you be with the doctors and the nurses who are working around the clock to help people survive, those that are sick, to survive all of this. A walk with each one of us, Father, as we share in our duties of trying to help uh, uh, manage and control this epidemic. We pray, Father, that we will do our best to go by the good advice that we're given uh, by those who know the most about this thing so that we can be helpers in this and also helpers for each other when any one of us comes up with lack of something that we need. We thank you for the opportunities to do that. We thank you, Father, for uh, Philip and Ed as they've worked hard to make this Zoom program work so that we can all be together. We thank you so much, Father, for the telephones and the uh, other ways that we have of, of being together and checking on each other and encouraging each other. We thank you, Father, for the extra class that we were able to have today. We pray, Father, that you will be with uh, those who are suffering from the pandemic at this current time, be with those who have lost their jobs, uh, who have lost their uh, places that where they live and uh, are struggling at this time in all kinds of different ways, not only sickness, but in so many other ways. Be with all of us as we uh, confront uh, fears and uh, extraordinary stress uh, on our bodies uh, as we uh, live through these things. Help us to get to the other side, each one. Be with those who have lost people, loved ones in this uh, pandemic. We pray, Father, that this morning, Brother Ed will be able to give us a lesson that will be encouraging, help us through it. Help us to remember each one of us that God is standing next to us, helping us through all this. He knows what's going on and he knows best how to help us through this. Help us to rely on his, his uh, wonderful love. Uh, uh, be with us as we go through this and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I can't see it. Tony, I'm getting the screen share up. Just give me a second. Yep. Song we're going to sing uh, this morning. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter, everybody out there. What a blessed Sunday it is. We're going to start with uh, Because He Lives, is the first one we're going to sing here. <clears throat> God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. All fear is gone, because I know he owes the future, and life is worth a living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because he lives. Because he lives, 
I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he owns the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, across that river, I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. <clears throat> the next song we're going to sing is uh, He Lives. Hmm. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives, salvation to import. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives, salvation to import. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. We want to thank uh, Brother Tony uh, for leading us in song. It's certainly wonderful to be able to get together and uh, sing those songs. And I know it's a little bit different than what we normally do and how we normally do it, but hopefully you find it uplifting and encouraging to be able to sing with those of like precious faith and, and to be a part of uh, our assembling together. We're assembling a little differently, but uh, I don't know about you. I always walk away from this uh, encouraged uh, and strengthened, and hopefully that will be the case uh, today as well. Um, <clears throat> certainly want to make mention of the fact that uh, there, there are a lot of individuals who are putting a lot of work into making all of this happen and uh, indeed uh, continue to pray for them uh, as we continue to develop uh, and continue to bring this to you. Uh, I think we've been successful so far, whereas uh, a lot of others have, have uh, not and they struggle from Sunday to Sunday. 
uh, to uh, have some kind of, of worship and assembly. And I know, uh, it, and I want to encourage you, uh, because some folks have done it already, uh, reach out to those who are around you. If they're, if they're not uh, having services, uh, the place where they normally attend, they are certainly welcome to come here and be a part uh, of our assembling uh, together as well. But we're going to begin the lesson this morning um, by going back to that place that we read from at the beginning of our service, John chapter um, <clears throat> John chapter 20. Uh, and uh, actually, we're going to begin back in John chapter 19. We're not going to read through all of it, but uh, the bulk of the lesson is going to come from chapter 19 and chapter 20. Uh, have you ever noticed uh, that the Easter is kind of surrounded by confusion and misunderstanding? Um, I don't know, most of us think of it as a holiday and we celebrate and we get together with family. But from the very beginning, Easter has been one of those holidays that has been plagued with a lack of fullness and understanding, even going back to the original disciples in the context that we read there in John chapter 20, they're running to the tomb and, and, and they think that the body has been stolen. Um, they don't understand, we're told specifically. And then later on, we're going to learn that even when they do encounter the risen Christ, uh, they, they don't see him for who he is. Matter of fact, Mary thinks he's the gardener and she asks him, you know, where have you taken the body? So there's all of this confusion that is taking place uh, surrounding, even in the first century, even at the time of the actual events, um, there, there's just this overwhelming sense of, you know, what's going on? Uh, and, and there's confusion. You bring that into our modern day setting. And, and I, I don't know that a, a lot of folks really fully grasp the idea uh, of what actually uh, is taking place there on that uh, you know time when Christ uh, is going to be crucified, uh, he's going to be placed in the tomb, <clears throat> placed in the tomb, uh, and then he is going to rise again. You know what does that mean for us? What what are the things that we need to know about that that impact us? Uh, and today we simply sometimes refer to that as you know Easter, which is a word that really doesn't occur in the scripture. Uh, at all, though certainly the idea, if we are celebrating it correctly, is found there. Uh, but, you know, what do Easter eggs and chocolates and candies and all of that have to do with, uh, you know, Easter? Well, some folks have come up with some symbols and uh, certain things that go along with it. Uh, and, and while those can indeed enhance the holiday, I would imagine most people uh, are unaware uh, of exactly what the connection is between, you know, the bunny and the chocolate and the peeps and uh, the baskets and the hiding of them and, and the crucifixion of, you know, Christ. If you want to add to that, the confusion that, especially in this year, people have over, you know, the, the holiday itself. Uh, you know, uh, President uh, Trump uh, made, uh, well, I don't want to say the mistake. Uh, I think it was wishful thinking, uh, but uh, he wanted the country to be back open by, you know, Easter. And, and you would think that, uh, you know, the, the next uh, worldwide flood was coming. Uh, we have religious leaders coming out of the woodwork saying some of the most inane things about Easter that you would ever want to hear. All you got to do is type it into the internet, look it up, and you'll have people, you know, claiming that this pandemic is, is just like, uh, you know, Christ being crucified. And we're not, you know, in the resurrection stage, and we're only in the crucifixion stage, and we're still walking up that hill. And <clears throat> it's just a, all a big ball of, of confusion. Um, and, and it's difficult uh, to really get to the, to the truth of, of the matter. And people are distracted from this one simple fact. Jesus Christ went to a cross. He died for you. He was placed in a tomb and he rose again. To borrow Paul's words from Romans chapter 6, there is an expectation that we will follow in those footsteps. If you get nothing from the lesson today, get this one simple point, that the cross is the fulfillment of the promise of God for you to have forgiveness of your sins. You can have that life that is made perfect by his blood. See, that's the message uh, of the cross. That's the message of the spilling of his blood. He pays the price for uh, our you know, sins, but it's all about the promises uh, of God. One time I heard a little story, and it's probably one of those preacher stories, right? The little boy on the Easter Sunday is sitting there in the, in the pew, and his friend comes in and sits down next to him and notices a bruise on his arm and says, how did you get the bruise on your arm? And the little boy replies by saying, well, I was eating some Easter candy. Uh, and, and the boy says, well, how do you get a bruise from eating, you know, Easter candy? And he says, well, you get a bruise when it's your sister's Easter candy, right? So, I mean, you know, there are promises, 
right? And, and there are promises that are certainly implied when we, you know, engage in certain activities. Heard another story about uh, two brothers, <clears throat> two brothers uh, on Easter getting ready to, you know, color eggs. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I grew up doing that. Matter of fact, my, my grandmother's house uh, was um, kind of a place uh, for Easter. She, I remember she had these plastic molds uh, and she would heat up chocolate and put in various colors and she would make her own you know, Easter candy. And those are the things that were really, really good. We enjoyed those. Uh, and I still remember my favorite ones that she used to make. And I remember asking her to make these specific ones that were a specific color and had a certain taste uh, to them. So they, we heard about two boys one time, they're getting ready to color eggs. And uh, before the, the eggs are boiled, one of the brothers looks to the other one and says, hey, I'll give you $10 if you let me um, break three eggs over your head. Uh, and, and the brother says, okay, 10 bucks. And so he stands there and the, first, the brother takes one of the eggs, smashes it on his head, runs down his forehead and all over his face. And then second egg, boom, smashes it on his head and it runs down the back, goes into his shirt and, and he's standing there and he's waiting for the third egg and nothing happens. Still nothing happens. And finally, he turns to the other brother and he says, look, are you going to put the third egg over my head? And the brother says, nah, if I did that, I'd pay you 10 bucks, right? So, you know, he leaves you hanging there with uh, just the two eggs, but God doesn't leave us hanging. When God makes a promise, he fulfills that promise. In the cross, in this context here in the book of John, reminds us of those wonderful promises of God. As we think about Easter, we should be thinking about these promises, and there are at least three of them. Each one of them is marked by something that is left empty um, from the time of crucifixion until the time of his resurrection. And I'm just going to give you three of them today. And there's certainly a lot of things that we could mention. We could go back and, and we could look at, at the cross and we could look at the remnants or the relics of the cross that, that day after, that, that Sunday morning. You, you certainly would, uh, you know, examine those nails that are tainted with uh, the blood of Christ, that cross. Uh, that, that that is left there, the crown of thorns still, you, you know, still, uh, you know, wet with uh, the blood of the Savior of the world. We, we could go back and we could look at all of these things that are part of that uh, scenery, uh, part of that, that brutal uh, scenery, but yet that scenery that brings salvation to humanity. Well, the first of these, however, we're going to mention is the empty cross, right? It, it's just, a, it, it's a wooden cross. Uh, and, and it's the cross upon which Christ would be laid. The nails would be driven through his hand, and it would be on that cross uh, that he would utter those many statements uh, as he, you know, would would perish uh, throughout uh, the the course of that fateful, you know, day. Um, Jesus is led there. Uh, he's led there by you know lies and jealousy and anger and, and betrayal. Uh, he's led there by a false accuser. Uh, who would be put into play and used by a group of chief priests uh, who would enrage the crowd, who would cry out to crucify him. Uh, and yet he never lets go uh, of the promise. You, you may recall that uh, back in the garden, long before the trial ever takes place, back in the garden of Gethsemane, Christ is there and he's anguished. He knows what is going to come. He, he knows that this is going to be a difficult night and a difficult day you know, for him. But at the end of the day, he, he looks toward heaven and he says, you know, if it be your will, Heavenly Father, um, let this cup pass from me, but your will uh, be done. Right. And all of that is, is pointing toward it, uh, toward this idea that when he go, when he went to a cross, it, it was that, to that cross that not just he was being nailed, but the sins uh, of the world were being nailed there. Your sins, my sins. You see, the same sins that put him on that cross, demonstrated by his own disciples in the betrayals, uh, demonstrated by the, the chief priest and all of the crowd that was gathered there, the jealousy, the anger, the rage, the, 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 all of the different things that are happening there are, are the same things that we demonstrate in our life, um, you know, time and time again. The, the same jealousy, the same, you know, strife, the same murmuring, the same complaining, the, the same lying, the same, you know, all of those things. You know, and we know that those things have a wage, right? The wages of sin is death. But you see, we're fortunate in that we did not have to die for our sins, but Christ was willing to go to a cross and die for those things. Uh, I was reading a book one time about, uh, I can't remember the author's name, but she was telling about um, 
standing in the kitchen one day and her daughter was working feverishly uh, on, a, on a piece of paper on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and uh, just uh, the look on her face was all serious and she wondered what she was doing. But uh, as she was about to go over and check it out, the, the girl set the pencil down and came over uh, and she handed, uh, handed this list to her mom uh, and said, mom, here's a list of my sins. Right? And she said, uh, mom picked up the list uh, and she looked at it and she began to chuckle because the list read like this. Here are my sins, Jackson, Jason, Mason, Samson, Carson, right? Now we may all have sins in our life that read like other people, uh, but certainly this young person did not understand that sin is, is not a person's name. Uh, it, it is something that separates us from God. It, it is something that creates a, a darkness you know, in us uh, that does not allow us to have you know, fellowship uh, with uh, our God. And until that sin is taken care of, we are separate from the very one who, who made us, who, who created us, who, who brought us into you know, this world. Every sin that comes into our life uh, has a, a price tag, right? You, you yell at the kids and you lose your temper. Boom. Sin. You, you covet your friend's car. Boom. Sin. You envy your neighbor's success. You, you lie. You lose control. You, you give in to temptation. You doze off during Ed's sermon today. No, okay, so maybe not that one, but you know what I'm saying. You, you know, you, you sin in every single one of those sins. It, it's not just this kind of, you know, nebulous idea that, you know, we, we put a little in, we put a little in, we put a little in, and, you know, each one is a small percentage, and eventually we reach a certain percentage, and then that becomes sin. No, each and every little infraction is, is a sin against God, and each and every little infraction is a is a going to be a thing that you know separates us from him you know and each one of those is worthy of the wage that it brings forth death Romans 6 and verse 23 tells us that Colossians chapter 3 verses 13 through 14 basically tells us Paul writing that we were dead in our trespasses and sins we, we were dead in our sinful desires and we were cut off from God but then God sent forth his son. And because he sent forth his son, all of our sins can be forgiven. All of our sins can, you know, be blotted out. Is what the Bible tells us. Is what Paul tells us. You know, and Paul, of course, writing, looking at his own life, he would call himself, you know, the chief of all sinners. So Paul was a guy who understood, you know, what it meant. I mean, this is a guy who drug people from their homes so they could be killed simply because, you know, they were Christians. Paul understood what it meant to be a, a sinner. And he feels the weight of that burden for, as far as we can tell, based on his writing, the remainder of his days here. Oh, he knows he's forgiven because he's come to Christ and he's come to that cross and he's received that, you know, life-giving, you know, blood. But he knows what it is to sin. So when we look at the empty cross, we've got to think of the sins that were nailed there. We've got to think of the promise that those sins would be taken away. If you turn over to John chapter 19, John chapter 19, <clears throat> beginning uh, with uh, verse uh, 28, John records this, and this is the, the death of Jesus. After this, Jesus, knowing that, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so that they put a sponge full of sour wine on the hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, it is finished, uh, of course, it's been, you know, variously interpreted, but he, of course, meant the, you know, the redeeming um, word of God. But if you go back to the original language, um, it is the word to telestai, and it's an accounting term, believe it or not. It's a term that would have been used for people who kept the books. Uh, and, and essentially, it, it means to pay something in full. Right? Most of us know what that is. Uh, even when I was a kid, we had, we had this thing called, you, you know, um, the, the Christmas Club. And you could buy gifts and you could, they would hold them for you and you would slowly and surely pay them, you know, off over the course of, of time. With, with no, you know, no added interest or charges or things like that, but you would pay it off. And, I, and you would just, you know, imagine what it would be like when you first began, uh, when that last payment came, right? 
it's just a, a wonderful and glorious moment. Well, here when Christ says it is finished, literally he's saying it was paid in full. At the cross, your sins were paid for. Your sins were paid for. Promise fulfilled. The second uh, thing that uh, was empty is, uh, of course, the, the empty clothes. Uh, they're folded there in, in, the, in the tomb. Uh, that, of course, was Joseph of Arimathea's uh, tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea and a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Uh, and uh, Nicodemus, uh, uh, and we're not going to go into it much today, but I, I think Nicodemus is one of kind of the unsung heroes uh, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You remember we first meet Nicodemus when Christ comes to him in the middle of the night and has that conversation about how a man can be born again. Uh, and then here, by the time that Christ uh, is being crucified, uh, Nicodemus is, seems to be all in. Uh, otherwise, he's not going to go appear before anybody, any magistrate, anybody who could, you know, harm him, uh, certainly in a public way, uh, if he is not committed to Christ. So, you know, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were both, uh, you know, Pharisees. They secretly believed in, in Jesus, but here uh, they had to make a, a determination. Uh, and, uh, of course, we know that Joseph of Arimathea gives the tomb. We're told also that they go to the cross uh, and they get the body of Christ and they take it uh, and they lay it. Uh, in the tomb. John chapter 19 and verse uh, 40, verse 40 says that uh, they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, uh, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So they take the body, they, they wrap it in, in these cloths with spices that are kind of mixed in, you know, between there. Uh, and we're told later on that when they come and they visit the tomb, those those clothes are, are laying there, uh, and the wrap in particular that is around his, his head is folded neatly and set separately um, uh, aside inside of that, you know, tomb. Now, <clears throat> it's amazing to me that, uh, well, several things uh, about this particular, you know, context, but uh, it's amazing to me um, what we're told about, you know, these guys going to the tomb, they, they go there. And one of the things that they, they focus on uh, are those clothes. I mean, Christ is not there, but the clothes are still, um, you know, there. Uh, the, the body is not in the wraps uh, of linen anymore, but the wraps of linen uh, are still, you know, there. They're left behind in order for these, you know, disciples, <clears throat> these disciples to, to see you know, doubt is swirling in their heads. You know, the Bible tells us that they're not fully convinced. They, they, they have not remembered that prophecy that he has, was going to, or they didn't understand that prophecy that he was going to rise from the dead, that he was going to deal uh, a, a crushing blow to the adversary and in, in running, um, or, or excuse me, rising uh, from, you know, the grave. Uh, you know, so here they are, they, they run to this tomb. One, of course, is John, the other one, Peter. Uh, and all of a sudden, things are confusing. All of a sudden, they, they just don't fully understand. And I think most of us can kind of relate, you know, to that. Uh, Christ is, you know, crucified, and, and they're uh, just seemingly willing to kind of go back and, and do what they had done, you know, before. Uh, their world that they had devoted themselves to for at least the last three years is seemingly all now you know, up uh, in, in smoke, you know, and life is uh, going to get, you know, hard uh, for them. Uh, but, um, you know, we understand that as well, especially in these times when people around us are, are having great difficulties. There are folks that we know who, uh, you know, the great people, but, you know, they've been hard hit by the, uh, the financial aspect of, of this crisis. We know people who have been, you know, caught up in the actual, you know, virus uh, it, itself. It can be devastating. It, it can cause us to be, you know, confused. It can cause us to actually, you know, lose faith and maybe not uh, believe, you know, why are these things, you know, happen, happening to us? And we begin to wonder if, if you know, God is uh, even there. Well, we try to put ourselves in, in you know, John's uh, position. Um, and we try to put ourselves in, in that position of, okay, um, he's gone. What do we do now? We try to put ourselves in the position of all of those apostles. You know, okay, he's gone. You know, what now? Then they wake up on Sunday morning uh, and they go to the tomb. And the body's not there. Mary comes with the urgent message and they, they run. And I find it interesting that, you know, that, that they run um, because uh, it seems to me that, 
you know, they're, they have an expectation of something. They're it may be excited about uh, something. But they, they run and they go and see. And John, of course, outruns Peter. He arrives first at the tomb, but he stands there frozen at the entrance. And as he looks in, he sees the linens and all of that wrapping there. And, and no doubt his mind is starting to race. If someone had stolen the body, would they have thought to take the clothes off and put them there and fold them neatly? Well, that certainly would have been a waste of time, right? You know, but I want you to go back and I want you to look with me at John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to read just a couple of verses, um, beginning with verse 6. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw, now notice this, he saw and believed. Just moments ago, we were told that they didn't believe. Uh, if we go to all of the gospel accounts of this, when, G when Jesus dies, they, they don't expect him to, to rise from the grave. God had made the promise. Christ himself had, had made the promise, talking in terms that, you know, maybe they didn't fully understand, you know, destroy the temple and re he'll rebuild it, right? Maybe they were seeing things more about their own lives. Their lives seem now destroyed. Their doubts are, have crept in, uh, but Sunday comes, uh, and the body's been stolen, they, they say. Of course, it wasn't. Uh, but uh, they run to the tomb, and they see the linen cloth there. And, and seeing the linen cloth there, John knows immediately. I don't know what all he remembered. I, I don't know every single aspect of why it happened. But it says that he saw and he believed, right? For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again. So it seems like he remembers that. It seems like he recalls that, that message. But he sees the cloth lying there and he knows that that is the case now there are plenty of things in life not just today not just this past pandemic but no doubt in in days to come uh, that will cause you to to wonder you know is all of this true you know, is there a, a god you know does he really care for me can, can i really have these horrible things that i've done you know taken uh, away and the answer is yes. When we look at the price that Christ paid, when they got to the tomb and they saw it empty and those clothes lying there folded up, it was a tangible reminder of the death and the resurrection of Christ. And they remembered he rose again. And no doubt they remembered the words that were promised as well, just like he rises again to walk in newness of life. We too, Romans chapter 6, can rise again to walk in newness of life. Just one more thing that I want to mention. The empty tomb itself. <clears throat> the tomb in which Jesus laid, uh, was laid to rest, was, was, uh, we're told in the scripture, was basically uh, a cave. It was a, a hollow cut out uh, of a solid piece of, of rock. It, it would have been costly, but then again, you know, Joseph of Arimathea being one of the you know, uh, upper, you know, end uh, of the fair, of the group of Pharisees uh, would probably have been a pretty wealthy, you know, guy. Um, so he volunteers his tomb and Christ is placed um, in, in that tomb. And, and of course, we understand uh, that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, he makes his, you know, tomb, uh, makes his, you know, final resting place with, with the rich. Right. So, you know, Joseph, <clears throat> they place uh, him in the tomb. Uh, Peter and John, they come, they discover it. They see the, the empty clothes. Uh, they return to town. But, you know, Mary and some of the um, Jesus female followers, they, they stay there. They linger at the tomb. And, and you remember, as they're lingering at the tomb, an angel comes and appears to them and says something like, don't be afraid. Uh, we know that you're looking for Jesus um, who has been crucified, but he's not here. He has risen from the dead. Uh, as he said he would, come and see the place where his body was. And in order to read that, you can go over to Matthew, uh, in the book of Matthew, in chapter uh, 28, verses 5 and verse 6. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. As he said, come to see the place where he lay. So the angel offers the, this evidence uh, of the fulfillment of the promise. Uh, by taking them to the tomb and saying, look, 
it, it's empty. And that tomb remains empty uh, even today uh, as a reminder, as a reminder, as a, as a symbol um, that, you know, life outlasts the grave. In, in other words, the empty uh, cave promises us a forever, right? It promises you an, an eternity uh, that you can go and that you can be with God. Christ himself rose from the grave. He was seen by hundreds. Uh, and then uh, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, we're told that he ascends uh, into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God. Now, forever might be, or infinity might be, or eternity might be a concept that is hard for us to kind of, you know, wrap our, our hands around. But just like he had told Nicodemus long before that tomb was, you know, offered, long before they took his body from the cross and put it in that tomb, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Just like he assured the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4 and verse 14, those who drink of the water I give will never be thirsty again. It became a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Just like he announced uh, to the, the crowds, no doubt on many occasions, John chapter 6 and verse 47, for it is my father's will that all who see this, <clears throat> see his son and believe in him, should have eternal life. I will raise them up in the last day. So the empty tomb is not just a, a reminder that, oh, well, he rose again. It, it's also a reminder that he rose again to go to eternity. Uh, and we too, when we come to the cross, uh, when our faith is, is affirmed and, and we stand boldly upon it, then we can have that eternal life that is offered by it. So we have these three promises uh, of God that we find in these symbols uh, that are there on the day that Christ rises uh, from the, the grave. Now, Paul, he put it a little differently. I want to go over to, to the book of Romans, uh, and I want to read uh, the passages that we've kind of been alluding to for the entire lesson. But Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 8 through 10. Romans 6, verses 8 through 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And that's the way Paul puts it. And hopefully that's, uh, you know, the way that we you know, are living our lives based upon these things that God has given us. The, the empty cross it reminds us of his sacrifice. The, the empty clothing, uh, you know, r reminds us, <clears throat> reminds us to, to have that faith that is unshaken. And of course, the empty tomb r reminds us that we have an, an eternity. Christ himself would tell his disciples one time, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he would go on to, to reveal that he was going away. He was going to uh, a place to, to prepare uh, rooms for them, a dwelling place for them. And that later they were going to come uh, and they were going to take up that habitation, you know, with him. So the empty cross promises forgiveness for all sins. The em empty clothes promises faith uh, for they, those who stay close to God, even in the darkest uh, of days. And then the empty cave promises a forever that we can go and be with our God if we are the children of God. So, so let me extend that invitation to, to you this, this morning. If you are not a child of God, it, but you want to know, okay, what does that mean? How can I become a child of God? And we use the words child of God, but, you know, we, can, we could very easily say Christian. Have you become a, a Christian? Are you a Christian? And when we say that, we don't mean you've thought, well, yeah, okay, I'm a, I want to be a Christian, so I'm a Christian. What we mean is, have you heard his word? Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You know, have you been convicted by it, right? Have you heard? Do you have that faith? Um, have you repented of your sins? If we don't repent, if we don't change our mind about sin, the sin that separated us from God, the sin that put Christ on the cross, then our journey stops there and we're left in our sins. So have you repented of your sins? Are you willing to confess the name of Christ that he is the son of the living God, Romans 10, 9 and 10? And have you been 
to the waters of baptism? Have you been in that watery grave, leaving your sins behind there, washed in the blood of Christ, rising to walk in that newness of life? You, in a, in a very real sense, becoming that resurrected person who will stand to inherit eternity and be with God. Right? Have we done that? If you haven't and, and you want to do that, please reach out to, to one of our elders here at the Pentecost Park Church of Christ or myself. Um, if you have prayer needs, please put them in the chat. Uh, if you have any other need or, or questions that you need answering, please you can contact me privately or contact any of our, our, our elders again, uh, and they'll be more than happy to uh, help you. I appreciate everybody coming and being patient and listening uh, to the sermon this morning. Uh, and um, I'm going to now turn it back over to Brother Tony Glenn, who is going to lead us uh, in the song that will prepare us for uh, the Lord's Supper. We're going to be singing the old rugged cross this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to that old cross. We can keep going, Ed. <laughs> to that old rugged cross, I will ever be true. In shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday 
to my own far away where is glory forever i'll share so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Brother Steve Belk will now lead us uh, in our Lord's Supper. If you have that, you can go ahead and get that out uh, and prepare. I've got it, Ed. Oh, you've got it, Philip? Okay. Yes. My bad. Yeah, we've learned in the last few weeks that isolation is, is tough. And uh, in a very, in a, in a short time, Jesus goes from being treated as a king to being treated as a criminal. He goes from having many followers to having just a few followers. The night in which he instituted the Lord's Supper, and that last supper, he's there with his, his close, closest friends. And after he institutes the Lord's Supper, he goes on to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he takes his very best friends and goes a little bit further with them and asks them to stay there while he prays. And we, we remember how they fall asleep while Jesus is praying and the disappointment that he has that they can't stay awake during this time that, uh, that he really needs some encouragement. Uh, at right after that, he is betrayed by one of his own followers. And then Peter denies him three times. Afterwards, he's uh, arrested. Accus false accusations are made, up, made against him. He goes through this scourging. He's being spat upon, made fun of, and mocked. He's hanging on the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels. We sing that song. But he died alone. As he's hanging there, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see the grace and mercy that Jesus offered for us on our behalf. And it's through the atoning blood of Jesus that we could have our sins washed away. Otherwise, we would be lost in sin. It is that blood of Jesus and that perfect sacrifice that, as uh, Steve mentioned in his uh, class this morning. It's that bridge that gets us from a separation from God to where we can be in a covenant relationship with God. So as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let's remember that sacrifice that Jesus made and that, he, you know, that he went through it alone. Let's bow together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings that you have given to us. We're so thankful for the love that Jesus had for us and allowing himself to be the sacrifice for our sins. As we partake of this bread, let us remember that his body hanging there on the cross, crucified for our sins, nothing that he had done wrong himself, but that we might be able to be reunited in a covenant relationship with him with God. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow again. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue this prayer 
praying that you'll be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents the blood which Jesus shed upon that cross, the blood that washes away our sins, cleanses us, and makes us whole. We're thankful for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf and help us to always remember that sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody can hear me. Let's let's take a minute and go to God in prayer. Will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we we come to you at this time thanking you so much for the love that you have for us, for the way you express your love to us and 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 sending your son just as we remembered his death on the cross just now. And, and we thank you for your infinite knowledge and you being our creator, that you know what is best for each and every one of us, and that you desire to send things that we need, not just things that we want. We know that not all things are comfortable, but we thank you for the circumstances that you send our way to help us to grow circumstances that will cause us to question, that cause us to look for answers. And we thank you for giving us feeling, giving us the desires and emotions. And we thank you for the desire to understand. And we pray that we will always have the desire to, to understand the truth, your truth, the truth that you have presented to us through your word. And, and we thank you so much for your word and, and you're breathing out your word to those men that were able to write it down and, and for your power in preserving your word that we can have it today. And it's through your word that you also created the universe, that you set forth all the physical laws of motion and and we can observe that your universe is, is a universe of order. That you have set things about how you, how you have planned. But many times it's, it is our decisions that, that cause things to go wrong. Uh, bad things can happen. And, and we pray that you will be with us at this time when the world is experiencing uh, this pandemic, be with those who are deeply infected by this virus, those that have lost family members that you will comfort and strengthen them. Be with those that have lost their jobs and help them to find ways to, to provide for their families. We pray that you'll be with those first responders, those medical workers, those essential workers, all those that are, that are out there risking their lives to, to make our lives better. We pray that you'll be with those that we personally know that, that are out there working for us. Pray that you'll be with Scott Williams, who's in the Navy Reserve, and he is out working to help victims at this time and continue to be with all those that are doing the good works help us all to grow closer to one another during this time help us to find opportunities to reach out to others look out for our brothers and sisters and all those that we come across that may have need help us to provide for their needs and help us also to find ways that we can share the gospel with others I mean our sister Rena has has asked to have the strength and be able to have the words to share with her son, Thomas, and be with her, help her to say the right things she can say to her son and her daughter-in-law, and be with all of us that, 
we can say the right things to encourage others to, to have a desire to, to search for you. We pray that you'll be with our nations around the world. Uh, be, with, be with our president, be with our government as they make decisions that all their, their decisions will be good decisions. And we pray that our government will make decisions that are in accordance with your will. And we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to assemble here this morning as your family. Uh, this way that we've had to, to be together, to be joined together as we worshiped you. And, and we pray that our worship this morning was pleasing to you. And we pray that as we are about to, to, to depart, depart at this time, that we will not leave you behind, but we will continue to look at you for the guidance and comfort. For you are the great, great healer, you are the great comforter. And, we will continue to look at, to you for comfort. And we pray that we will remember that Jesus, after he died, he was not found in the grave any longer, that he was resurrected. Through your power, Jesus was able to overcome death. And through your power, you have provided an opportunity for us to overcome spiritual death as well. We pray that we will continue to be seekers of you. And thank you for all the blessings you have given to us. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen.